Professor Stuckler here. Listen, in general, in the university, we don't talk enough about the mental health of our graduate students. We talk so much about skills and productivity, but we don't talk about the softer side, our emotional states, our well-being, that really power us to move forward. And the reason I'm making this video is because I'm seeing a new form of anxiety in a lot of students I'm working with across the world. So it's not just a developing country or a high-income country phenomenon. It's not field-related across the board. And many of you understand or might have felt anxiety, that feeling of being restless, or like you're on edge, you're irritable, you get really tired easily, tough to concentrate, you feel like your mind just goes blank. And this is incredibly common. Uh, I've got a link below to a study that just came out in Nature Biotechnology that surveyed, this was done in the US, it surveyed over 2,000 masters and PhD students across 142 US institutions, and I found over four and five, over 80% experienced both anxiety and depression at some point in the graduate program, and it was much worse at the beginning. Often it was triggered by harsh criticism, unrealistic expectations from their mentors, and those who experienced those feelings had five-fold higher likelihood of thinking about quitting their program. And as I've talked about before on this channel, that ultimately leads to burnout and a big loss on the investment you're making in yourself, and that can be avoidable if you take the right steps. But what I'm really seeing here, just as the situation's already bad as it is, is a new form of anxiety that's directly linked to using AI, or what I'm calling now AI anxiety. And this is perhaps a bit ironic because a lot of students thought or maybe do think that hey AI is gonna help them it's gonna help them move faster feel more confident give them more rapid feedback maybe even take some shortcuts along the way to avoid common pitfalls that other grads are getting into and they see other grads getting ahead and they think oh well maybe they're just using AI better than me and that's what I'm gonna do now to get my research papers and projects done fast but in practice what I'm seeing with a lot of students is really the let me give you two examples, and then I want to come to some conclusions, part of the conclusions that are building on the study that I just, showed you, just talked about, because that study actually gave some recommendations on how to alleviate the problem, and some recommendations that are about how to use AI in a healthier, more productive way that's going to sustain your productivity over time. So first example came in actually in a class uh, recently. I was training some students uh, around some research methods. We were going step by step and doing some systematic reviews together. And I noticed something really interesting because what I was doing is I was walking around the class. I was asking and engaging with the students to see you know, how they were doing, were they following the steps and the method, were they getting stuck, what they needed. And as I looked over their shoulders, I could see about half the students were using ChatGPT. They kind of had it up on their screen, ChatGPT, and were constantly engaging with it, asking questions about what to do. And the other half were following the steps that I set out in the training, the kind of tried and true steps to go forward and do a systematic review. If you're interested in systematic reviews, by the way, we've got a 100% free step-by-step -step playlist. Uh, check it out in the link below. And what was happening is the AI students were getting kind of spun in this hamster wheel of asking ChatGPT to do something, doing it, feeling really uncertain about it, asking ChatGPT again, updating what they did, and feeling really unsure whether they got things right or not. And when they asked me, I said, listen, you're going completely off piste here. This is, you're going down a rabbit hole and this is the wrong direction. It had almost this tendency, almost this gravitation, this pull to go back to ChatGPT to get help. When I was standing there right next to them saying, hey, listen, this is the right step here. And, and I think one of the challenges here is that ChatGPT would give kind of one-off, one-liner advices to the students, but was not training them in a coherent step-by-step -step system. And that's a feature of LLM models, which, uh, these, these language models, is that it's kind of plucking information that's out there bit by bit and optimizing that information for your specific question, but it's not necessarily operating from a coherent system or a whole for publishing or producing research paper. So let me come to a second example of, of some anxiety that was triggered by AI. And this was a grad student who was coming to me. She had Got finished her research proposal and she was now starting to write up her literature review chapter. And she really did, was a bit lost at sea and didn't know what to do. 
and so turned to ChatGPT. You know, she got a lot of harsh, negative supervisor feedback and really wanted to do better. And so this was kind of the natural remedy. She was really trying hard. So ChatGPT had created some lit review tables and helped her find a structure and way to summarize her, her information uh, from papers in her field. She had shared that with her supervisor and her supervisor really liked it and said, hey, this is great. Keep doing more of this and update it in this and that and that way. So the student went back and the problem is she, she didn't understand what was going on. She's like, okay, I just got positive feedback from my supervisor. I actually don't know how to do this. I don't even understand what I've done that she liked. And now I don't understand how to incorporate or integrate her feedback to update these tables and structure. And I don't have the big picture. And I really feel now like a fraud. And it triggered a lot of feelings of imposter syndrome and a a lot of students I deal with grapple with this where they feel like they're just not good enough. Like they're gonna be found out about, that they're gonna get kicked out of the program because they, they really don't deserve to be there. If you feel those feelings, by the way, we've got another training on imposter syndrome. It's perfectly normal. It's a sign you're being stretched. It's actually a sign of progress. You don't want the opposite of that, which is done in Kruger, where you think you're really amazing, but you're really terrible and you're so thick that you can't even realize it. But um, that's for a, another conversation. Um, but these two examples, I think, are showing the dynamics of the anxiety that AI, rather than, than helping reduce, are actually exacerbating these feelings of nervousness, of uncertainty, of, of even feeling like a fraud, and it's already all too common, as if the mental health situation couldn't get bad enough. And, and I think, you know, a lot of students in the past, when they didn't know what to do, they would go to YouTube and they would start hunting around to try to find advice. And, and again, much like ChatGPT firing off, boom, bullet here, here's an idea, here's an idea, here's what to do, they would get these mixed pieces of YouTube advice that don't add up to a coherent system or a coherent whole that you can really act on. The danger though that's even worse with AI is it can give you a false positive reinforcement feedback. It, it can tell you, hey, this is great, keep doing this. And as I saw in the first example with the students in the class, ChatGPT was reinforcing the wrong idea. And so remember, I mean, right now we're at a point where ChatGPT version five um, should be coming out and that promises to have PhD level intelligence. Well, if you're doing research, you, you need beyond PhD. Uh, level intelligence ultimately to get to where you want to go. So uh, I think it's really important to engage the right way with AI. And there is a right and a wrong way to do that. But ultimately, right, the, the reasons students are becoming so dependent on it is because it's plugging a vital gap and that they're not getting clear, routine, steady feedback and the support that they need to truly thrive. In fact, so I want to come back to that study, that study in Nature Biotechnology, definitely worth reading because this is the field you're in in this moment in time and this it affects you. And you, I don't want to see this happen to you because it's happening to four out of five grad students that they're suffering from significant mental health problems. And what that system pointed to, they said there's systemic issues in graduate education and suggested some critical reforms, including improved mentorship, suggesting to train advisors to provide constructive criticism, as well as emotional support, um, financial support, because yes, I mean, there's constant triggering factor of financial instability among a lot of grads that does worsen mental health and community building really suggested that a, a lot of students are isolated and they needed to foster peer mentorship and create supportive professional networks. And that's what you find in the private sector. People are given a lot of support, a lot of training. They aren't just expected, like it's so common in science to just, hey, figure it out for yourselves. And then they go onto chat GPT and they get on the anxiety hamster wheel. So how should you use AI in, in the right way? How can it help? Because it really can. It's, it's first, it's no substitute for real effective mentorship, full stop. As a grad student, that is what you need. If you don't have that, you need to find it. The biggest risk factor that the paper found uh, to uh, wanting to quit and, uh, and and not feeling good and feeling a lot of anxiety and depression was right, having to do research that the students felt they didn't understand or know how to do with unrealistic expectations from their supervisors and mentors. And it was particularly bad. The worst, by the way, was in the first year students uh, earlier on in their training. It's almost as if you could get over that first hump, then you can kind of fly and sail and, and you got through the worst of it. Um, so for AI, here, here's what you need. So I do use AI and I, I share with 
uh, my postdocs and research team and, and others on this channel the right way to use it. And the first way is to use AI to accelerate your learning of appropriate research systems. So I've got a uh, postdoctoral researcher and we are about to engage in a research study a natural experiment, which tries to simulate a real experiment, except we're not randomizing people. They're just kind of, uh, being assigned by the natural world into an intervention group and a control group. And I told them for, for the study, we need to use a design called a synthetic control method. I said, look, here's some textbooks you can read, but also use AI to help you learn things about setting up a synthetic control study. This is where AI can really shine. You've already got a system. You've already got the framework you're operating in and AI can then teach you and help you accelerate your learning. And in the background, uh, my postdoc of course has me to help guide and help provide that routine steady feedback to let him know, hey, wait a second, chat GPT is taking you down a rabbit hole and you are going off track. Doing this saves both of us a ton of time. And he's come back and commented to me about, wow, it's incredible the rate at which I can learn together with chat GPT in this way. Feeling no anxiety, none of that AI anxiety, because we know he's on the right track and I am checking to see that he's getting the right training that he truly needs. So AI can help you learn. The second way is for AI to help you find structure um, to your ideas, to help bring clarity to a lot of messiness that you might have. And, and this is what science is ultimately doing is you're trying to bring order to disorder. And so when you go to AI and you have loose knit ideas that are not woven together, AI can be a sounding board to help you find a structure to more clearly lay out those ideas that you already have. So this is part of a general principle of the model with AI. We wanna preserve what's uniquely human about what we do, but tap kind of the like big machine capability of AI to perform things like almost like a statistical analysis. Like here, we're gonna cluster these ideas. How can we lay them out more clearly? What kind of structure could potentially work? Um, so you don't wanna use it to replace your thinking, but maybe to aid and support it. So finding structure is, is a great thing that AI can do. And then the third is, really to treat AI as a sounding board. So um, bounce ideas off. Again, you have your uniquely human idea, bounce it off AI to get some critical feedback. I even like taking the prompt with the AI to say, hey, um, critique my paper. Try to anticipate what peer reviewers might say. What are the weaknesses of this paper? What could I do to strengthen it? Pull holes at it. And that's kind of what you want to do when you're going in front of, when you're producing research, you're going in front of independent professors, you're going in front of the peer review community, and they're gonna start slinging arrows at you. And so use ChatGPT or these other AI tools to help armor yourself up to be more bulletproof. And I hope you can see that when you use AI in these kinds of ways, you're using it as kind of a co-pilot, as like a buddy on your shoulder helping you to drive. But the problem is it's a co-pilot. If you start having AI drive the car, um, I don't know if you've ever driven a, a car and you get the, the, that kind of backseat driver yelling at you, say, hey, turn left, oh no, stop that. It triggers anxiety. And uh, that's an analogy for what I, I truly think right now is going on with AI. So listen, that, Nature Biotechnology paper made some critical recommendations about mentorship and community. And that is exactly what we're creating at Fast Track. Check out my 100% free Facebook group where we are committed to trying to plug the gaps left in our higher education institutions, higher education institutions that are often, particularly in the UK right now, going through deep budget cuts that are reducing staff um, and drastically cutting down on the real support the uh, students get. And it's exacerbating an already bad situation. So I hope you'll join us as we try to rectify that and build a truly unique, powerful, interdisciplinary community of students mutually reinforcing and helping each other. I truly believe in the transformative power of mentorship and real communities. And I hope to see you there and check out this next video if you're interested in learning more about this emotional side of support that's so often neglected but critically important to your long-term success.